All right. So we're going to look at this model. We're going to look at uh, paradigms and the, the psychedelic framework that I like to call it. We'll look at the three medicines, and then we'll talk about our, our goal today. So we've been facing this, uh, the actual consequences of the pandemic, which hit a few years ago. And what we saw was a rapid escalation in mental health issues across all populations, particularly impacting young teens. But uh, I think the consequences are really broad and throughout. What we see is that uh, depression, when you look at uh, prevalence issues, often doubling or tripling during the pandemic. And those numbers do not appear to have come down dramatically. I think they have come down somewhat, but the bottom line shows you that uh, one out of three Americans may be experiencing serious significant depression. And, and these are jaw dropping numbers. So as we segue into this discussion of psychedelic medicine, we need to be aware of the sort of indigenous roots of this, the historical uh, precursors that we have, and that this is not uh, such a new thing. It's new for our understanding and our current use of healthcare and delivery of healthcare, but this is not new on the planet. This is not new with humans. So let's just keep that in good context. So just some broad definitions. Um, we have classical psychedelics, and these are things that tend to work on the 5-HT2A receptor, things like LSD, mescaline, psilocybin, DMT, and whether that DMT is 5-methoxy um, or not, uh, these still all have a similar mechanism. Then we have the empathogens, things like MDA, MDMA, and 3-MMC. These are agents that have a heart opening. They tend to not have a lot of perceptual distortions. People tend to feel safe, secure, present, fully embodied, and um, not a psychedelic in any way. No psychedelic mechanism, really. Then we have other non-classified psychedelics like Ibogaine and 2CB. Uh, probably have similar mechanisms, maybe not as well understood, not as well researched. And then finally, we have this category, sort of an outlier of dissociative agents like ketamine, nitrous oxide, dextromethorphan. And uh, all of these are in studies now for treatment of depression. They uh, have some similarities, some differences, but uh, it, it is just a, um, it's a little bit of an outlier in terms of our understanding of mechanism and process. So I want to segue into talking about paradigms in mental health care. And a paradigm is a, is a broader philosophical representation of how we understand science, how we understand the framework of the data that we're working with. And what happens when we have a restrictive paradigm is gradually we have more and more anomalous data that doesn't fit into that paradigm and that people mostly just do a lot of hand waving and shoulder shrugging and ignore. But at some point, someone comes up with an understanding, a scientific rationale that's broader than the old paradigm, inclusive of it typically, but broader and more encompassing. And when that happens, there's typically a shift in our understanding. So this work was really, our, our modern understanding of it was developed by uh, Thomas Kuhn in his book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, 1962. And these are these sort of discontinuities. And a couple of things that he points out in his book is that the science alone, the data alone does not transform paradigms, that they're more socially um, driven than you might think. And that, uh, you know, there's a joke by um, Max Planck, the uh, quantum physicist, that science changes one funeral at a time. And what he meant by that is that you have the old guard, the thought leaders, people that are in established positions of power and authority and respect. And until they start embracing the new paradigm, a lot of people will cling to an old paradigm. And uh, you know, very often we cling to old paradigms because we're uncomfortable with the novelty. We're uncomfortable with the nature of the change in our understanding. And sometimes it's difficult to wrap your head around. Think about the difficulty that physicists had moving from Newtonian physics to relativity or from conventional uh, particle physics to quantum mechanics. 
these represent very significant paradigm shifts. So let's see how this uh, functioned in mental health. So there's a great book that I highly recommend called Mad in America by Robert Whitaker. And in this book, he outlines all these different paradigms that we've held in mental health care. And, and you know, unfortunately, uh, all too often associated with horrific treatments that were abusive and punishing and just would be considered inhumane by any sort of uh, perspective today. But at the time of Benjamin Rush, who signed the Declaration of Independence, we had heroic medicine. It was bloodletting. It was a system of understanding, almost like plumbing, uh, because circulation was a new, important, novel concept that was driving a lot. And, uh, you know, George Washington died of excessive bloodletting to treat a sore throat in 1799. And we called it heroic medicine, because if you survived, you were a hero. Um, and then there was this wonderful little uh, period of moral treatment pushed by the Quakers. And it lasted like 20 to 40 years, but it was something that would be inspiring and thoughtful today. Pretty holistic. They would put them in beautiful settings and treat them well and uh, feed them well and connection with nature. So that was really a a wonderful period. And then we moved into more institutional care and all the significant people with mental illness were often treated in asylums. And the superintendents, the psychiatrists of the day were in charge of these things. And um, a lot of bizarre ideas came out of this and mistreatment. Then we have Freud and the psychoanalysis. We have eugenics, which was a strong force in mental health in the first part of the 20th century and really understanding people with mental illness as defectives and thinking about how to eliminate them from the gene pool. Then we have this whole rush to shocks and psychosurgery with uh, insulin shock, electroconvulsive shock, lobotomies. And, you know, um, Enid Marinz won the Nobel Prize in 1951 for discovering the lobotomy. So it really wasn't that long ago. And then finally, over the last 70 years, we have psychopharmacology driven by the chemical imbalance theory, that we have an imbalance of neurotransmitters, and that's what's causing uh, mental illness. And that really, if you're a psychiatrist working today, you're using this often unspoken paradigm that uh, is how we structure our care and treatment. So all of these are important to understand, and just knowing that these things evolve and change over time. So if we look at psychopharmacology, um, we have a lot of challenges with it. And, you know, certainly we can look at the data where 30 to 40, sometimes 50% of people develop treatment resistant depression. We have this model of care that is sort of debilitating to providers and to uh, patients where med checks and it's sort of this monthly parade where a revolving door of medication adjustments and then the body's homeostatic mechanism really comes back into balance and pushes the medicine into less effectiveness. And then we struggle. And you're in this constant battle with the body's innate uh, desire to balance things out and correct these insults from the outside. And there's, there's a lot of uh, you know understanding about the limitations that we have with psychopharmacology. But uh, just knowing that this is kind of one arm of what's happening. And the other arm of what's happening in mental health care is really psychotherapy, talk therapy. So we have provider, we have prescribers, and we have therapists. And sometimes some people do both, but often people are relegated into one camp or the other. And that's their role in the mental health care system. And for much of the last 70 years, these two arms have often fought each other because the more heavily medicated people are often the less available and motivated they are for talk therapy. And, um, and sometimes it works in reverse. If people are engaging in talk therapy, they may be less motivated for medication, but that's not always the case. But as we can see that with, with psychotherapy, we often have these limitations where it tends to work for milder or moderate problems but if you've ever tried to talk sense to someone with psychotic level depression, you realize that logic and reason does not really work in this case, and that they get locked in these ways of thinking and understanding that make them very resistant to change. And so, but what would happen if we could combine these two arms of mental health? 
I think we could get something that would be very much advanced over what we currently have. We could engage people better. We could try to reduce their defensiveness. We could try to emphasize the value this would have to the psychotherapeutic experience as opposed to just merely pharmacological management of misery. And um, what we wanna do is see how these two things would come together and what type of a paradigm shift would that create in mental health? So interestingly enough, this is from the British Medical Journal in 1944 using uh, narcoanalysis narco with nitrous oxide. Sodium amytal was also big around that time. And William James uh, percolated with this stuff in the late uh, 1800s. Freud obviously was interested in cocaine, but it uh, became more of a problem than a support. And But this is a model that's been around, this thinking about how pharmacology could support change in mental health. So let's talk about the psychedelic framework, because that's really the model that we're talking about today. So I really see three key things in the psychedelic framework. First is container. And this is pretty close to the traditional psychotherapeutic model where you have relationship safety. You think about setting, you think about trust. Some of these things are very amplified in the psychedelic framework. And there's also a piece of psychoeducation that has to be included here because um, the psychedelic framework is new and novel to people where most people have an intuitive understanding of what talk therapy is, but not with the psychedelic framework. That, that is really new and novel for most people. The second piece of this is the catalyst. And these are agents that alter the flow of information. They alter consciousness. They change our experience. And by changing our experience, they change our understanding. They change insight. They change the data that we have access to. They change our access to memories, past, traumatic, et cetera. And interestingly enough, these do not need to be medication. Um, Larry earlier was talking about holotropic breath work. So our breath can become an agent to change consciousness and awareness. Um, you know, there's shamanic journeys that people can participate in that do the same thing. And that has, you know, a millennia of use across the globe. And then finally, we have a carrier. And this is something that supports taking the journey inward. These can be things like uh, music, eye shades, uh, headphones, drumming, anything that drives the experience inward. And I think ultimately this is underpinned by a shared belief system between the practitioner and the uh, uh, journeyer that uh, they believe that uh, going inward is part of the solution, part of the journey. It's uh, just part of their belief system. So now we have medication-assisted psychotherapy that is making its way through the FDA. I'm not going to go into this here because you're probably all familiar with it, but MDMA MAP submitted their new drug application a couple weeks ago. Uh, psilocybin is working its way through both by Compass and USONA. And this is the first time the FDA has tried to consider the approval of a new drug combined with psychotherapy. Uh, you know, the FDA has been around for a long time. They've never encountered this before. I think that may be a sign of a new paradigm. So we have MDMA. We'll spend a little bit of time jumping into it here. And this is just such a lovely agent to work with. I had the opportunity and blessing to work with it in the early 80s before it was scheduled. Um, having Andy Weil as a mentor has a lot of uh, intrinsic advantages. And one thing is you're, you're very quick to move into these um, innovative areas. And um, I found it just uh, really powerful. And I felt deeply committed to work with MDMA and deeply frustrated when it was scheduled by the FDA DEA in 1985. So it was really exciting for me to be able to come back around and participate in research about it. So it's been around for a long time, over a hundred years. It was patented as a styptic agent to try to stop bleeding. Well, heavens knows it didn't do much for that. So they dropped it. It was investigated a little bit in the 1950s for appetite suppression. 
but because of the rapid tactical axis that it really um, just was not of much value. And uh, then we had its rediscovery by Alexander Shulgin in the 70s and this whole cohort of psychiatrists, psychotherapists who used it in the late 70s and early 80s before it was scheduled. And now there, I'm sure there's thousands of therapists working with it underground now because that, uh, that awareness and insight of its value has really never left. And it's not a psychedelic, it's rather an empathogen and it's an agent that helps us feel closer to others. I think the, the most profound central thing that MDMA does is it makes us feel safe. And it makes us feel safe on a level that we haven't felt in um, probably since we were in utero. Now, who knows? But it makes us feel safe and secure. Our anxiety falls away. But in a related way, our neurotic defenses fall away. They just fall away. They, they just dissolve. And this is why I found it so useful in couples therapy, which was mainly the work that I was doing in the early 80s, is that uh, partners have love for each other and they feel safe. They can drop their neurotic defenses and they can just share their affection and concern and appreciation and then move to acceptance for the others, uh, for the others otherness, if you will, because that's often our struggle in, um, in a relationship. So uh, one of the things that's really useful is to see that there's really no loss of control. And so people that uh, freak out about psychedelics and have high levels of anxiety, uh, MDMA, although there can be a little bit of anxiety in the first hour while people are, are coming into the experience, in general, it's anxiolytic. And that is true of ketamine as well. So people that have high levels of anxiety can have very difficult transitions with the classic psychedelics. The pharmacology of MDMA is interesting. So certainly the monoamines, but also probably more pointedly perhaps is its effect on oxytocin and prolactin, the bonding hormone. So the combination of the anxiolytic and um, the sort of empowering effects of a broad monoamine support combined with oxytocin creates this bonding and heart opening that's just exquisite to, to witness and, and to experience. This is a survey of 20 psychiatrists done in the early 90s. These are psychiatrists that had been working with MDMA. And uh, here's a survey of the features they found of it. But basically, I think if you were to try to design a psychotherapeutic agent that would accelerate conventional psychotherapy. Um, MDMA is probably the closest thing we found to that ideal agent. Uh, and I joke with people that the altered perception of time gives you some creative ways to bill for this as well. So, oh, sorry, that was a bad joke. All right, let's look at study design. This is a phase two study design for MDMA. Phase three is not that much different. The pyramids are... Uh, experimental days, medicine days, and um, the green stripes are psychotherapeutic sessions. So you have prep sessions, integrative sessions, and then a two month follow-up and then a long-term one year follow-up. And this was our article that just got published in Nature Medicine. This was published uh, mid-September. And this was the second half of our phase three study, the confirmatory phase three study. And this really, for me, was coming full circle in my early introduction to MDMA and then the ability to support our team up at Wholeness. And I noticed a number of our providers and uh, participants from the study. So a shout out to my homies up in Fort Collins uh, on, on the uh, call today. But uh, let me just jump into a little bit about this. A couple pieces. Number one, I think one of the things that became clear to me as we were working in this, when you're trying to recruit people with severe PTSD, almost always they have layered PTSD. And what that means is they have PTSD that was developmental, often in their first five, certainly 10 years of life. And then they have other traumatic events that uh, combine. And it, it's, it was pretty unusual in our study to see someone who had single event trauma and no prior trauma history. And that's something they found with veterans as well, is when you go overseas and you have a significant trauma history, 
you're much more likely to be diagnosed with PTSD. And the rates of diagnosis of PTSD in our veterans has escalated with every decade since World War II. Maybe we're becoming more conscious of it and maybe developmental trauma is more prominent, unclear, unclear what the reasons are. But certainly what we can see is comorbid depression, 90 to 100% of the time, suicidal ideation, very common. Um, and these are people that had uh, PTSD on average for 16 years with multiple courses of failed pharmacology and psychotherapy. The first half of phase three, MAP-1, was done with only with severe PTSD. And in MAP-2, we included moderate and severe PTSD for a little more representative sample. And here's the data point. And what we saw, and basically both groups got psychotherapy, and one group got placebo, one group got MDMA. And they would start out with 80 plus 40 supplemental of MDMA, on the first session and the second and third would be 120 and 60. And what we saw is very significant drops in their CAP score. Um, the effect size of this intervention looks to be about 0.9. To put that in context is that sertraline and paroxetine, which were approved by the FDA in the 90s for PTSD, had an effect size of 0.3 to 0.4. So we're talking two to three times the effect size of our current available treatments. And it's no wonder that the Department of Defense and VA is very frustrated with the tools that we have. Reported adverse events, it was really well tolerated. And uh, you can see some of the things like muscle tightness, nausea, decreased appetite, uh, feeling hot, cold. These are relatively minor and we really we screened pretty significantly for cardiovascular safety, and we really didn't have any significant cardiovascular events. And we were worried that this could derail the whole process. We saw suicidality, but um, actually more significant in the placebo population. And one of the things that we clearly saw in our studies was that the first week after the first MDMA session was the most difficult vulnerable time because often people are uncovering levels of trauma they didn't even know they had. Um, and often the first session was often a developmental framework and, and they're starting to unpack some of their developmental trauma. And then we often in the second and third sessions get into their more adult-based, whether it's combat trauma, rape, uh, motor vehicle accident, whatever it was. Let's talk a little bit about psilocybin. So it's been around for a long time, found in many species of mushrooms all over the world. And recently we've had it um, legalized in both Oregon and Colorado. So we're actively working with it at our clinic now in a harm reduction model. And um, it's been, it's really been phenomenal. We can talk more about that in the discussion. This is some of Robin Carhart Harris's earlier work. And what you see is two doses of psilocybin, uh, 25 milligrams, as I recall. And what you see is a prolonged decrease in depression severity. And it's remained significant out to three months, but still noticeable at uh, six months. And this gives us a sense of durability with this stuff that we've not seen with prior, you know, Right now with our current agents, you have to take it every day of your life mostly to have response. And um, it, it's often helping people through their episode of major depression, but it's not necessarily um, remitting it. This is a pivotal landmark study um, done by Roland Griffiths, who, who died late last year, much to the dismay of the whole psychedelic community because he was a real leader. But uh, I love the title for this. Psilocybin can, occasional, can occasion mystical type experiences having substantial and sustained personal meaning and spiritual significance. Well, let's, let's step into this a little bit. So they got either methylphenidate or psilocybin, um, double-blind, randomized controlled trial, and substantial personal meaning and spiritual significance and attributed to the experience sustained positive changes in attitude behavior. And 
61% of the people in the psilocybin group had a complete mystical experience. So what, what does this look like? Or 83% of the people said, this was the top five event in my life comparable to the birth of a child, my marriage, or the death of a parent. 89% said it created behavioral change. Interestingly enough, the intensity of the psilocybin experience was not predicted, but the intensity of the mystical experience. And you might say the intensity of the psilocybin experience was probably the pharmacological event. And the mystical experience is the subjective reaction to that by the individual. And these events sustain and have good durability. Now, if we look at what were the outcomes of this, they noted an increased love of others, decreased hatred, increased gratitude for life, increased reverence. And, you know, these things start to look like they came out of a, a Sunday church attendance and not out of a psychedelic experience. But this sort of leads into the second part of the talk saying, what are the consequences of working with psychedelics? And this is different than we see with psychotherapy. Um, we can just talk briefly about end of life and probably no area fits more cleanly, uh, neatly, and intuitively than using psychedelics at the end of life. Uh, a study, once again, by Griffiths, looking at um, uh, 51 adult patients with life-threatening cancer given full-dose psilocybin or low-dose control. They found these significant changes in people's uh, understanding of their uh, process that they were in. And these are really existential changes and these effects sustained at six months for 80% of people. Just talk briefly about psychedelics in the brain. Um, this is a map on the left of someone's uh, network network and hub connections within the brain uh, on placebo or at baseline. And you can see that the networks and hubs are predominantly close fall connections among nearby networks, and there's very few cross network interactions. But with psilocybin on the right, what you see is just um, a vast broadening of the entropy and change in the system. And Robin Carhart Harris has created a speculative model around psychedelic impact that looks at its ability to change the entropy within the brain. And the more entropy change that is seen, the more likely people are to have change that endures down the road. Uh, diffuser tensor imaging of the default mode network and this is probably our best internal representation of self, ego. And that what we see is that uh, default mode network activity ramps up with depression and it decreases with meditation. So Richie Davidson's work with Tibetan monks show a dose-related effect. You can tell by a monk whether they've had 10,000, 20,000, or 30,000 hours on the mat, how much their default mode network decreases. And we're now understanding that default mode network preoccupation, which is really self preoccupation, is one of the hallmarks of depression and likely anxiety. And that the more people are wrapped up in themselves and preoccupied, the more likely they are to be um, dysphoric. Here, interesting is some electrophysiological measures of brain activity. And in the center here that I'm identifying is the default mode network. And you can see on the left baseline and on the right with psilocybin, massive decreases in default mode network activity. And this may be one of the things responsible that psychedelics reduce our veil that we create for ourselves in the default mode network and allow us to perceive somewhat independently of that false self. Let's talk a little bit about ketamine. So I think we're moving to a place where ECT is going to be outmoded within the next few years. And we're now beginning to see head-to-head -head comparisons with ketamine and ECT, where the advantages of ketamine are becoming real. And this is using ketamine, I would say, at uh, suboptimal doses and suboptimal treatment protocols. In these protocols, they're comparing to ECT, they're using only six sessions of ketamine versus eight 
or 12 of electroconvulsive therapy. And they're using 0.5 milligrams per kilogram of ketamine, which almost everybody in the field says, although it's our default, it's not ideal. And that if we were using 0.7 or 0.8, which is closer to the sweet spot with ketamine, we'd see even more significant results. Um, here's a forest plot showing ketamine studies for depression. And the pattern is clear, the effect size is large, and we just really don't have much crossover. There's not a lot of disagreement that ketamine is not an effective treatment for depression at this point. Ketamine is unique. How do we categorize? It's not a psychedelic, although it can have psychedelic-like effects. It's a dissociative, but ultimately, does that matter? In our psychedelic framework, it doesn't matter whether agents are classic psychedelics or not. Bottom line here, literally the bottom line is ketamine increases neuroplasticity, increases synaptogenesis. It increases our ability to learn change and create new routings in the central nervous system. And that becomes our definition of behavioral change. Ketamine alters maladaptive beliefs. This is a, a small study looking at treatment resistant depression, finding pretty quickly that ketamine causes um, updating and a shift in our optimism bias within four hours of treatment. And that may be its um, part of its core effect. It's different. We're seeing response, particularly with suicidal ideation in a few hours. You can use it almost any way. At our clinic in Fort Collins, we do IV, IM, sub-Q, and uh, sublingual. Occasionally, I've done intranasal. Uh, I don't work with Spravato. It's a generic drug, although since we started using it, the price has doubled, but still pretty darn cheap. It's now almost hard to find sometimes. And I should say, and this might be a point to digress on, is that there are two models of use, the pharmacological, and these are the infusers, often um, anesthesiologists or emergency room docs, uh, nurse anesthetists, that use it in a pharmacological model. And then there's the psychotherapeutic model, which is um, built in a more ketamine-assisted psychotherapy framework. And right now, the whole field needs a large study where we see a pharmacological use of ketamine compared to ketamine-assisted psychotherapy. Until then, we're going to have two camps in the ketamine world. We have two camps in the psilocybin world right now, the Compass people. And I, you know, I hate to say, but I think it may be driven somewhat by the the um, commercialization challenges in a uh, medication-assisted psychotherapy. The Compass people are really out there promoting that it is a pharmacological intervention. And all the rest of the people in the psychedelic world, I won't say all the rest, but the vast majority of people believe in a psychotherapeutic model, the psychedelic framework. So what we really need is a um, study of psilocybin pharmacological versus uh, psychedelic framework. And until we have those for ketamine and psilocybin, we're gonna have two different camps in these fields. This is a study showing more evidence on suicidal ideation for ketamine. Emergency rooms are now giving people ketamine infusions because it gets them out of the emergency room and can get them home to manage them in a safe way. It enhances fear distinction, much like MDMA. And we find at our clinic that ketamine is useful for PTSD. We now have a, quite a few randomized controlled trials just using ketamine pharmacologically without psychotherapy, showing it a benefit in PTSD. So ketamine does all the things that we want in this medication-assisted framework. It enhances bonding, um, it enhances excitement, BDNF levels, default mode network activity is decreased and it helps with interpersonal openness. So it's really a supportive agent for this. So current practice, what's practical? With COVID, we saw healthcare workers dramatically impacted by care delivery of care. Um, that's my daughter in the center. She's an ICU nurse. She was working at a Harvard hospital deaconess when the surge hit in Boston in 2020. And ICU nurses are supposed to care for two, sometimes three people. She had eight to 10 people. They had makeshift ICUs made out of waiting rooms. And she was pretty traumatized by this and many of her peers as well. And that motivated me to find an intervention using our psychedelic framework. 
And what we developed was a model. It's now a seven week model. We've adapted it for our second grant uh, for healthcare workers. We're now doing uh, public service workers. So we're doing teachers and um, first responders like police, firefighters, and paramedics. They have a prep session, three medicine sessions with ketamine, three integration sessions, and um, we're seeing very significant results. Here's the effect size we're seeing for trauma, depression, and anxiety in our first cohort that went through. We published on this, and um, uh, we've been very impressed with it, and we're really trying to bring this in as, a, as an intervention because we're seeing burnout rates in primary care docs that is in the 40 to 60% range. That's just horrific. And you know what's interesting is the same thing is true with firefighters, police, and teachers. It's just anybody who's public facing these days is overwhelmed. Um, you know, what, what, are, what is the risk of this? This is uh, grandpa and, oh, don't mind grandpa, he's just having an acid flashback. So, um, but we do have harms and risks. This is, uh, David Nutt did this for the Lancet a little over 10 years ago. And what he did is he categorized morbidity and mortality to um, people of different psychoactive agents. And if you look from the left, basically what you see is this weird public policy thing where basically every other um, drug here is illegal. Every other drug is legal. There's no coherent public policy on this, but if you look to the far right side, you'll see the psychedelics. Uh, ketamine is about in the middle and Matthew Perry documents that indeed ketamine can be harmful. So not arguing that point. Look at psilocybin, basically the studies show that no serious side effects. I joke with people that in our clinic, we've used ketamine, I think over 7,000 sessions and we've used Ativan once. I tell people that hand-holding is worth about a milligram of Ativan, and that's often all you need for a difficult session. Classic psychedelic use is associated with reduced psychological distress and suicidality in the U.S. adult population. So we have that as a side effect, is that people that take psychedelics generally are less distressed and less suicidal than their peers. But what are we still missing? We've got a framework, we've got catalysts, we've got a model, we've got research coming. What are we missing in terms of a paradigm? Paradigm. So what is a mental, what does mental and emotional health really look like? What is our goal? You can look through all the psychiatric textbooks you want. And I actually did this when I was writing my pediatric integrated text 10 years ago. There is no model of mental health that's integrated into psychiatric literature. It's, it's standalone, it's psychological work, and it's um, not part of our, our psychiatric framework. So the research says a single psychedelic experience increased a range of non-physicalist beliefs, as well as beliefs about consciousness, meaning, and purpose. And if we look at what spiritual distress is, this is what's epidemic in the U.S. right now. We are having an epidemic of spiritual distress. We categorize it as anxiety, depression, but really it, it has these core elements. It's an existential challenge. But what if we had tools that would help open up spiritual medicine, tools that could shift our foundational beliefs, something that get beyond our defenses and rationalizations beyond our default mode network? that reduces our barriers to a sense of connection with person, place, and nature and community. Um, what would happen if we had tools that could do this? Um, well, we actually know now that psychedelics can alter our core beliefs. And um, the studies are coming out now clearly showing that psychedelics alter our core belief system. And that is because it's not a pharmacological effect but this is an experience that people are having that gives them a different way to understand the world. And when that happens to people, you don't typically go back to a different way of understanding. And that's why the results are so durable. As long as we cling to a pharmacological model, we will not understand this. 
this work is about working with the psyche. It's about working with spirit. And um, we can think about psychedelics as spiritual catalysts. They open and accelerate an innate process to get us in touch with our own spirituality. They remove these artificial barriers and they begin to heal the mind, body, spirit split that our society, life, even our healthcare system engenders. So I think this helps us to see that we're really part of something greater and that um, once we get in touch with our spiritual self, healing can occur on many different levels. And I think that's the premise here. That's the paradigm shift. And that's really what I'm trying to share with you today. And I think with that, um, we can segue Larry and Becca into some dialogue about this and thinking about how I might have been provocative or uh, challenging or, heaven forbid, helpful in understanding this process. Thanks all. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so there are no questions in the chat. Um, so if anyone has one, feel free to type it in or you can raise your hand and um, I can call on you and you can unmute yourself. Okay. Um, Catherine Maston asks, what does the therapeutic model look like when the agents are prescribed? Is there use of CBT versus DBT versus MI, et cetera? So let me see if I understand that question. How does it differ? How does the psychotherapeutic model differ when you're using prescribed agents like ketamine versus um, schedule one agents in research? I guess I'm maybe not understanding the thrust of the question. I, I believe that's what's being asked. Catherine, if that's not correct, you can unmute and clarify. I think my question is just geared towards what um, the practitioner looks like in practice. Um, is there a therapist that is with the patient while they're having this psychedelic experience and what kinds of therapy um, work best when someone is using these psychedelics? Yes, the psychedelic framework as a psychotherapeutic model means that there's someone in person with that person for the whole experience, for prep, for the whole journey, for integration. Um, and what that means, interestingly enough, um, we in the LSD study that we did, we were not allowed to do psychotherapy. We were allowed to be present and they wanted uh, a licensed mental health professional and an additional support person present for 12 hours of the LSD experience, but they did not want psychotherapy. But we still had to do prep and some integration, you know. So it's interesting. I think we're seeing this dichotomy where commercial interests are pushing to a non psychotherapeutic model, whereas the rest of the field is embracing a psychotherapeutic framework. But there was always someone present for the whole psychedelic experience. Now, some of the people doing infusion work with ketamine set people up like uh, chemotherapy and just set them up with uh, IVs and then let them be, sometimes without music or an eye mask, which is really kind of a horrific way to experience ketamine. It's funny, in our first grant with uh, healthcare providers and group ketamine, we had some ER docs that went through and what they said is, I will never, ever give ketamine again to someone the same way that I've been doing it after going through this myself. So, um, yeah, it's it's a, creating a container that's psychotherapeutic. The person has eye shades, they have music, they have headphones, and they go in. In our MDMA studies, they have to go in within 20 minutes of ingestion. They're able to come out and process and talk, and then often encouraged to go back in, but... Uh, it's sometimes harder with some than others, and some people really resist the inner journey. Um, and so it's that way with ketamine-assisted psychotherapy. It's that way with uh, psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy. Um, it's that way with MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. And the therapy varies. The model that we're moving to in psychedelics 
is this model that's been popularized by MAP of the inner peeler. And this matches very nicely with the integrative model that gives us a sense that we can heal ourselves. A hallmark of the current psychiatric model is it's a pathological model that's focused on pathology and really has no understanding of healing. And I think that's one of the big differences in the psychedelic paradigm is that we've begun to embrace the healing power of the psyche and the personal experience as a way to create healing. And it's a path to healing and it even gives us a model of care. And I think that's a big difference that we've moved from the old paradigm to the new paradigm. So if the practitioner isn't administering formal ther therapy, um, how do they play the supportive role instead when someone is having this psychedelic experience? Uh, you, you cut out there. I did not hear that. Oh, I apologize. Um, so if someone is not actually administering formal therapy, um, how do they play the supportive role for a patient who is going through this psychedelic experience? Uh, people are doing psychotherapy in the psychedelic framework. It's a psychotherapeutic framework. And the, you know, it's interesting that I would say it's often easier to teach a nurse how to be a, an effective psychedelic facilitator than it is to treat an experienced psychotherapist because we have to drop the model that we're the expert, that we know better, that our interpretations and um, interventions are what's needed. And what's used in the psychedelic framework is this model. It's more of a midwif mo midwifery model where we're supporting a natural process, the emergence of the psyche and the ability of the psyche to have healing power. So we're not taking a directive role. We're taking a supportive and um, facilitating role. And so that's the difference. And often with established veteran psychotherapists, they have to forget more than they have to learn. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, our next question is from Darlene Sarcino. What have you seen to be the difference between micro and macro dosing for clients? Let's talk about macro dosing with psilocybin because I think that may be easiest and it, it reflects my view on the whole thing. With um, macro dosing, we're creating a transformative experience where someone has a personal experience that changes their view of reality, their life, and their journey. And that's the goal. Um, and we're seeing enduring results with that. Microdosing, where you're using a dose that may be 10% of the macro dose, it's often sub-perceptual. And with microdosing, you're creating a pharmacological effect but you're not creating an experience within the psyche that's really creating transformative change. So I liken microdosing is much closer to the Prozac model of mental health, where we're managing misery from repeated dosing. And given the risk we're seeing with, um, there may be a, a cardiac risk with psilocybin that the, the risk from microdosing every day or even every third or fourth day is really significantly different than two large doses of psilocybin that create transformative change. So philosophically, I'm against microdosing. Philosophically, I'm against home use of ketamine <clears throat> because I think all too often it gets trivialized. And I think I'm uh, standing up for a transformative model and I've seen practical experiences where microdosing makes sense for people, but I'm still going to advocate and teach a transformative model. Okay, so next question is from Dr. Ann Waldorf. Hi, Dr. Waldorf. Um, she asks, is there a suggestion that the changes in relational thinking extend beyond human interactions? For example, non-human animals, nature, et cetera. Yes, there's actually quite a bit of published work that uh, psychedelics and particularly psilocybin and LSD and not ketamine, not MDMA. Uh, so the classic psychedelics appear to cause a shift in nature relatedness. There's a shift in our understanding of our ecology, our sense of being present in a diverse widespread ecosystem. It's not anthropocentric. So I think um, yes, 
I think the psychedelics represent one piece that may help us with climate change and helping us feel closer and more connected to our natural roots. Um, okay, so Rick Miller asks, uh, what research has been done on more informal communities using psychedelics in a group, i.e. ayahuasca ceremonies that are being done right now in many areas of the United States and elsewhere? Well, there's been some informal studies done about ayahuasca. I think most of the studies, even starting with Charlie Grove's work, uh, survey work in the early 1990s, show that ayahuasca communities tend to be less psychologically distressed, um, less addictive. And so I think there's evidence that it's supportive. Um, certainly, our publications about group ketamine and the Roots to Thrive group out of Vancouver and their work with a more community-based model of group ketamine. Give us some evidence that group models, I, I think groups are gonna be the future of psychedelics once we get past our initial white knuckling and understanding the experience and helping it become uh, integrated into the mainstream. But I think once we get there, we'll see that using psychedelics in a community model may be the most, certainly the most cost-effective way, but there may also be increased power and increased uh, access, obviously, with uh, group models. So we probably have time for one more question. Um, Tyler Stableford, you're next. I see you have two questions here. Did you want to unmute and um, like ask one of those? Oh, sure, I could go to either one. Um, Scott, I had a question. I understand you're working with uh, alternation in, of ketamine and psilocybin at wholeness. I'm interested to see what you're seeing for results there and, you know, why you're doing that too. Um, what we're doing is we're, we're doing something from out-of-state clients who come in with treatment-resistant depression. And we're doing what we call the sandwich, which is ketamine on Monday, psilocybin on Wednesday, and ketamine on Friday. Well, our thinking goes along these lines, is the ketamine seems to open people up. It creates this enhanced neuroplasticity. They're more open to change. They're a little less defended, a little less stressed. And we think they step into the full psychedelic experience a little better. And then uh, on the other end, what ketamine does the psilocybin experience for some can be so big and so expansive that um, there's often difficulty into sort of reintegrating, um, bringing some closure to it. And what we see is that uh, having a ketamine experience gives them a little bit of closure to it that makes it easier to travel, makes it easier to transition back into normal life. In an ideal world, you know, I think we'd have a week-long integration process in a retreat setting, and we wouldn't need that. But um, uh, this model that we've been working with and using for the last seven months, we've we've been very pleased with, and we're seeing dramatic changes in people that have even had psilocybin experiences before or ketamine treatments before that have not been uh, complete enough. For them. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense, and it, it resonates with my personal experience with. Um, ketamine being very grounding after a very big 5-MEO experience. Um, and I hadn't put those two together, but I'm glad you did. Well, interestingly enough, um, Salvador Roquette, who was this rogue Mexican psychiatrist in the 60s and 70s, who did these wild, outrageous group treatments with psychedelics, yeah. he would often use ketamine to help land people after a big LSD experience. And um, so there is, there is some, at least anecdotal, uh, precedent for this. Thank you. Well, it looks like we are at time. Um, so I just want to say thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shannon, for speaking to us. I'm seeing tons of thank yous coming in the chat as well. Um, and again, this will be recorded. Um, I think the link is in the chat if you want to copy that so you have it for later. That's an option. Well, my pleasure. I really enjoy sharing this and helping people to step back and see a bigger picture to sort of all the stuff, the details are being hit with sort of day by day.
Scott, that was an awesome talk. I, I hope we can see you down here in New Mexico someday, get you, get you back down here. Twist my arm, Larry, twist my arm. <laughs>